Hello and welcome to Face to Face. My name is Godfred Akoto Boafo. My guest for today is a lifelong politician, academic, who, if he has his way, if delegates also have their way, by the end of February, he would also be the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress to face off with other political parties in the election in 2020. Augustus Obuadum Tano, a.k.a. Gusi Tano, is my guest on Face to Face. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. How does a young law lecturer end up vying for politics? It's quite a trip, for, vying for a presidential flag. Well, actually, many people say that uh, the next step after being a lawyer is to be a politician. I don't know whether that's quite true. But I've been doing politics almost all my life. When mm. I was in school, I was a member of the representative council, student representative council, uh, because I've always had a passion for progress in any community I belong to. And in this particular case, the progress of Ghana and the progress of NDC within Ghana. And I've worked also as a cadre in the revolution during the PNDC period, working with communities and workers to defend their rights, to defend their welfare issues, and also to transform our communities into viable economic units that have development, uh, farming, um, health care, education, sanitation drive, and so on. These are things I have a passion for, because I believe that if all 39,000 communities of Ghana can be developed, then Ghana will progress and move forward. Because really, our biggest enemy is not ourselves. Mm. It's not which ethnicity you belong to. It's not which uh, profession you belong to. It's much more, or which party you belong to. The biggest enemy facing Ghana is poverty, and, and the need to uh, bring our people out of poverty through correct policies, a clear vision and a well-organized society, starting from the community all the way to a local government system. Once you have an efficient local government system, then you can potentially have an efficient nation. You've experienced tumultuous times. You've experienced yes, I have. developmental times. Yes. You've, you, you, you've basically experienced Ghana's growth in democracy. But yes. there's a part I want us to start this conversation sure. from. Though. You left teaching to become the personal assistant of Jerry John Rawlings. Yes. That was quite a significant move. What did you see? Well, I, I felt that the uh, trajectory that the PNDC was on mm. in terms of uh, unifying the nation and setting a development agenda to bring Ghana back from the brink of despair and economic destruction that had been symbolic of the 80s and the military re regimes before that was an important uh, agenda that all Ghanaians should contribute to. So I felt that I also would give my quota, particularly in a situation where inflation was running at 147%. The black market rate, as opposed to the official city rate, was completely out of whack. You know, you had a situation where everything was down. Industries, mines, uh, farming, everything, cocoa, everything was down. And really, got, and so many people had left the country, my age group, mm. because of just the sheer economic despair. Many went to Nigeria, many went to South Africa, even to the Bantu stance, which was illegal at that time, and many also went to uh, Western Europe and America. And of course, uh, faced with that kind of uh, potential dislocation, we thought we all had to come on board to clean up our country, um, lift the economy, and lift our people so that we can progress as a nation. So yeah. that's why I left. It was a significant step, but I believe that the experience of being an academic, the discipline of being able to analyze, the discipline of progressing along a logical path, and also the sensitivity I've had as a community organizer mm. combined uh, allowed me to be a useful member of the Rawlings team at the PNDC team, and a useful citizen. At the end of the day, it's to be a good and useful citizen. What, what, <coughs> what was politics in those days like, though? Ooh, it, was, it was, as you said, a lot of turmoil. It was a, it was a revolutionary period. There was significant uh, confrontation of power blocks. Mm. The grassroots wanted power so that they could secure their interests and secure their welfare. The old existing power blocks resisted that. So there was a lot of confrontation and also uh, a lot of disruption. But every good thing often uh, begins with disruption. And gradually, as the revolution progressed, and as the process progressed, uh, things settled down to a more ordered, uh, more def defined roles for everybody. You had now institutions in, in the workplace uh, workers had a right to participate in decision making as well as in the communities. And of course, this for anybody who's been trained in traditional management was a challenge. But in the end, it was beneficial to the economy because many companies that were going down 
uh, were resuscitated, especially by just the sheer passion and commitment and dedication of workers working with management to transform uh, uh, an otherwise uh, terrible situation where a lot of those companies would have collapsed completely. You are in a unique position, so I can ask you this question. I've, in, I've interviewed a lot of people who've been part of Ghana's democracy, but you were on the right-hand side of the man who made the decisions at that point. 1992, what was the thought process in thinking that, okay, now was the right time for Ghana to become, to move from being, completing the revolutionary process, so to say, and becoming a democracy? Okay, I mean, there, there was within the revolution itself, uh, what, what we call popular democracy, where you had unit committees, uh, committees in the workplaces, actually articulating their point of views freely and openly, and as well at the community level. Mm. Then we transformed to a higher stage, where then the district assembly concept was brought. And so in 88, we had the district assembly elections as a first stage in our democratization process. Because I think the promise at the beginning of uh, the 31st December process was that we'll eventually move to a democratic uh, arrangement. But we had to do it stage by stage. So we had the grassroots democratization, empowerment, district assemblies as, as, a, as a consolidation of that uh, uh, by decentralization of power. Mm -hmm. And then we had the next stage, which was the um, national elections under a 1992 constitution, of which I was a part. Yes. And I think that uh, it was well done in an orderly fashion. And, and that brought us to where we are today. Uh, it was, it, it had a lot of, there were those who didn't want uh, a transition to democracy and there were those who wanted a transition. We, the young ones, skaters, felt that the PNDC had done enough work to be able to garner support to achieve a democratic dispensation and win an election and a democratic dispensation. And I think we've improved right. And you campaigned for that. Was that transition easy, though, from being a PNDC to an NDC? Naturally, I mean, if, if you are um, the only power in town and you are, not, you are accountable only to the extent that um, uh, you must, uh, for you to survive as a government, you must implement the correct policies and set the right examples and ensure that there's no corruption such that people will rise up against you. Your accountability is more in a gen general sense, but of course, once you have political parties, then you are accountable uh, to the electorate and they have a right to remove you and put you back, mm -hmm. you know, as the case may be. So, yes, that management of that transition was not, was not so easy, but I think that we've all adapted to it and, and we're moving forward. Unfortunately, our policy has become so partisan and, in a sense, so mindless, you know, that really the kind of unity of purpose that we saw under the PNDC is somewhat lacking now uh, because uh, at that time, people from different political, people from the PP, UP, and PP tradition joined in the PNDC, people from CPP, and we, the cadres, was joined in a unified effort to restore our country from the depths of, of crisis that it had descended into. Mm. So it was a unified national effort. Okay. With the partisanship, that <laughs> creates a situation where we all go asunder and feel obligated that even if a government is doing something that is correct, because it doesn't belong to our party, we are obligated to criticize it. Yeah. You know, and I don't think that's really constructive in the sense of where we are as a country. I mean, the West can afford that. Because their system operates, you know, uh, it's, it's in, it's in uh, cruise control. It, it operates, you know, with or without politicians because the economies are fairly sophisticated and, and fairly um, uh, diversified. Ours is at the beginnings of seeking to restructure, to become more self-reliant. Okay. And so you need everybody's hands on board, you know, the entrepreneur, the, even the foreign direct investor, uh, our indigenous entrepreneurs, which we must boost. Uh, our professionals, our working classes, and also our, uh, uh, um, what, what we call civil society. You know, it's, I'm not saying that we agree on everything, but where there's merit, let us acknowledge it. And of course, where there's criticism needed, we must criticize also. Now, it's interesting that you've gone through all these phases and you're now seeking to lead the NDC. Yes, if, one of the greatest parties Ghana has ever seen. But you left that party. 2000. I left, it, I left it on principle, you know. We were fighting, to form the National Reform Party. We, yes, we were fighting for NDC to be faithful to its founding principles, which is um, probity and accountability. And no Wasn't corruption it evolving, agenda. rather? No, I think after 92, you know, with this partisanship, 
the character that we are known of a real commitment to grassroots empowerment, a real commitment to social justice, and particularly a real commitment to a no corruption agenda, was beginning to lag and beginning to slack. And we felt that that would cost NDC uh, its fortunes at the coming elections in 2000. And it was important to begin to restore a new faith in our founding principles. Not everybody in NDC agrees with those founding principles or even is prepared to, to be bound by them. Mm. And we felt that there was, and that's been a struggle even within the revolutionary times of uh, empowerment of the grassroots as opposed to those who believe that the bureaucracy and the elites should control the party. It's, it's, and it's going to be a constant struggle. You know, I mean, democracy is such that you, you never rest in its defense. And, and, and we tried to defend that in NDC. It didn't work out very well. We were more or less pushed out. But we came back on the appeal of Professor Mills yeah. and came back to help. And it's, it's now a party that uh, is going through another transition of reorganization and hopefully will become more unified for 2020. But 2000 is important for me again because you, sure. you did contest the election. Yes, I did. And you were third. Was I? I don't even Yes, you had 1.1% okay. Okay. of the vote. You yes. were but basically we the third force. Yeah, well, you we could were, have built on that. No, I think that we've, all of us felt that NDC was our mother party and that eventually we will get around to uh, a dialogue. In fact, many of us were working and helping NDC after 2000. Uh, a lot of the marches uh, that were um, uh, Yabre marches and so on were actually mm -hmm. organized by uh, reform people and then NDC came on board. And that helped to mobilize the population against some of the ills of the MPP administration at the time. So we've been engaged. You know, it's our party, it's our mother party. We're part of its creation. And we believe that NDC is very important for the working people of this country and for the middle classes and the expansion of the middle classes and also for real indigenous entrepreneurs in terms of executing a national democratic agenda. So it's something that uh, we have tremendous uh, uh, passion for and cherish. But we also think that it's important that the Ghana agenda mm -hmm. is the main agenda of every political party. And as was explained to Bernard a few minutes ago, I think we need a consensus about where our country is moving, at least at the economic point of view. Mm -hmm. Because you can't play politics, too much politics with the economy. The, the economy is not a football that every politician kicks around as and when and where you please. You know, because it's people's lives, people's livelihood and so on. And I think that if you look at the history of, of uh, many countries that have made it and have sophisticated economies, Singapore, Malaysia, and so on. There was a consensus about where the economies were going to go, how to transform the economies from purely primary production, agricultural base, to an industrial, uh, light industrial, even heavy industrial uh, capacity, what to do with the new technologies, how to apply them, which human beings, which uh, skills we must develop, which training we must do, which we should emphasize, because the growth pool there is probably faster, and that growth pool then will pull up other sectors of the economy. We need to think that within the framework of a clear vision about the institutions of government, decentralization and the role of decentralization. This, this year assembly are not simply there to share contracts, mm -hmm. <laughs> road contract and, and school, no, no. They're there to oversee, promote, and develop the local economies in which they're in charge of. We need to set that agenda, make it clear, and push the resources, the personnel, the skills that make it possible, you know, in that direction. It's easy to see these things as a candidate, but yeah. when you become president, the reality is that you are beholden to a lot of people who have a lot of interest. That's why How do you separate those two? That is why it's very important to have a consensus about where we're pushing the economy to, where we want the economy to go. Because if you have that clarity, then everybody then follows suit. So whatever you do is in the context of achieving that objective. But what is the sway between the clarity of that purpose and the true need for money to run a campaign, the true need for certain people of influence well, to back I, I you to you've, achieve you've, that you've, area. I think you've heard me say many times, if you've been listening, that one of the, the, the dysfunctional aspects of our politics and which towards uh, prosecuting a clear, efficient agenda mm -hmm. and establishing a national consensus for economic development and transformation is the way we finance our politics. We can't continue financing our politics based on the states and screaming surpluses and illicit... Uh, uh, spreads from the state. To, no, we need to find a new way to finance our parties, both internally as parties, and hopefully, if we do the cost-benefit analysis and realize that perhaps, in order to reduce corruption, in order to reduce the misallocation of resources that arises from being beholden to big wigs who have money, then maybe it may be worthwhile for the state itself to finance uh, what you call it, uh, a political party at a particular election time. 
so that then we have a level playing field. Everybody has access to funding. Everybody then knows that, well, you don't have to go and inflate a contract to finance your party. Mm. It takes time. It's a matter that we, 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 we must pursue consistently over many years. But I also think that the instruments that allow us to fight corruption are available as we speak today, both in the law, through education, and so on and so on. And these are things that we must pursue if we are serious as a party, if we are serious as a country. You talk a lot about the grassroots. Yes, I do. You are in a contest with a lot of people who share a similar history with you with mm -hmm. regards None to... None of them do, actually, except maybe Alban. Yes, mm -hmm. Alban Bagbin was Alban, there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Even, let, let's <coughs> go to the PNDC, let's mm -hmm. deal with just the NDC. Alban mm -hmm. Bagbin was there at the mm -hmm. start. And Sylvester was there, too. Yes, mm -hmm. Sylvester. Mm -hmm. Spielgabra came in quite early as well. well. Uh, post, but he yes. came, he came <laughs> in. He <laughs> quite, came not in. as early as you, but <laughs> a lot of in. them can lay claim to being... Well, once you're in NDC there, and you cherish the values of NDC, then really the grassroots must be something that is important to you. But, as but been, all of you are preaching the same message. I, what I've been pointing out to uh, delegates is that the neglect of the grassroots of the NDC is not accidental. It is not everybody who is in NDC who believes in the founding principles of NDC. Some people in NDC are there for convenience. They think it's the largest party. They can achieve their personal agendas. And we're not in for that. We're in for the, for the prosecution of an economic agenda and a social transformative agenda. Mm -hmm. That lifts all Ghanaians up, not just NDC people. Mm -hmm. And NDC, we believe, is a vehicle that will make that possible because it has a grassroots character. It believes that all the 39,000 communities in Ghana must have development. They must have progress. They have good schools. They must have good, affordable health care, good hospitals. They must have food and food security. And also that uh, the young people of this country deserve employment. Between the ages of 15 to 24, 48% are unemployed. Mm -hmm. You cannot progress a nation with those kind of statistics. So as a country, and I've been telling delegates, we have a huge amount of work to do. And the only way we can do that is we're mobilized at the grassroots. We're organized, and our vision is basically one that we implement free of some of the problems that we face. As a, but is it not also the, the, the reality yes. that it is middle Ghana that is not listening to the NDC, not perhaps necessarily the grassroots. If you look at the numbers, the grassroots have remained very faithful to the NDC no, when really. it comes I mean, to many, voting. Many, many NDC, Middle Ghana seems to have ignored many the NDC. Many NDC rather. people did not vote in, in 2016 because they didn't like the NDC they were seeing. Yeah. And Middle Ghana has voted for NDC in the past. You forget that NDC was winning elections by 57, 58% first round. Mm. That was both grassroots, Middle Ghana, non-committed, floating voters, doing the talking because NDC, they thought, was a vehicle for this economic agenda and transformation. That has lagged a bit, and it's a time to revive it. That's why I'm in the race. If I didn't believe in Ghanaians, if I didn't believe in the collaboration of middle Ghana and the grassroots to transform this economy and make it a better place for most Ghana, I wouldn't do it. Are you worried that perhaps the NDC has moved on and left behind the values and the tenets that you said? Because I do also know that you yeah, were part yes, of the I team am. that wrote the party's own constitution. Yes. Yeah, I'm very worried. I'm very worried. And I think Ghanaians are very worried. I'm, I'm not the only one. Many Ghanaians are very worried. And many Ghanaians are also worried about the fact that um, uh, NDC is allowing MPP to set an agenda. You have to remember that MPP is, is, has declared, and they've never hidden who they are, mm -hmm. that they are property-owning democracy. So if you are not property-owning, you are not part of it. Mm -hmm. We are saying everybody is part of it. Whether you've been to school or not, you are part of it. Whether you have property or not, you are part of it. You know, whether you have money or not, you are part of it. All of us must join hands and transform this economy and make it a better place. And I think that NDC, as I said, is the party most suitable because of its history, because of its ability to attract so many diverse people to prosecute a national democratic agenda, which basically says that we want jobs, we want a social safety net, better managed free education. Don't forget, it's NDC that actually introduced the uh, uh, FQ, yes. free, compulsory, universal basic education, because the foundation of every school system, the foundation of any education po population is those years from nursery, kindergarten up to classes. Once you get that foundation correctly, then SHS becomes something that you can invest in and you invest in in a free manner progressively, because the Constitution also says, and it's not NPP that put it there, it is NDC's work in bringing together those who wrote the Constitution and giving it a social democratic thing, that indeed education in Ghana should become progressively free. Mm. And we've seen that now, but it's not being well managed. And NDC's uh, aim and ambition is to manage a proper free education system all the way up 
to SHS. All right, then you are watching. And also affordable health care and social housing and food security. There is no country in the world where if people starve, you can have progress, you can have productivity. If they're ill, you can have progress, you can have productivity. If they're not educated, you can have progress and productivity. So that social safety net, mm -hmm. that becomes the basis of our social intervention in a manner that is financed through our own surpluses and through borrowing soft money, long-term loans. So those who benefit from this social safety net, tomorrow, especially the young people, will be part of the people who pay it back. Okay. Or we are intergenerational responsibility, intergenerational finance. All right, then you are watching Face to Face. And my guest is Gusitano. When we return from the break, I will be probing further his dreams of leading the NDC and why he seems so distrustful of the process. Keep watching Face to Face. Trip of a lifetime. 97.3 City FM and City TV's Heritage Caravan is back. Get to experience culture and explore Ghana's favorite tourist destinations on the Heritage Caravan. Eight days, eight regions, amazing destinations, and exciting events. Mark up your calendars. The Heritage Caravan starts on the 2nd to the 9th of March 2019. Visit citynewsroom.com to register or call 0205 973 973 for more details. The Heritage Caravan 2019 is powered by 97.3 CTFM and CTTV. Tune in to The Point of View, Mondays and Wednesdays at 9 p.m. as Bernard Avlet takes the news further. He will bring the right guests, ask them the relevant questions, and get you the real insights you need on the big stories for the day. And what we are doing in the end is, well, I want to vote. I knew five years ago whom I'll vote for. But since you are going to ask me and I have to find some nice way to explain it, I will identify one or two things in my opponent's column and I'll tell you that is the reason why I'm voting because I don't like that. Mm. The Point of View with Bernard Avle, Monday and Wednesday nights, only on CTTV. Welcome back to Face to Face with my guest, Gusi Tano. Now, Gusi, NDC is going to vote for a presidential candidate. You are taking part in the race. But at almost every step of the race, we hear Gusi Tano and five others <laughs> throw up a red flag and say, hey, we are not satisfied with the process. Why are you so distrustful of this particular process? I've, I've, I, in my conversations with delegates all over the country, I've tried to explain to them NDC standards must be and are much higher than MPPs. Mm. Our standards for an electoral process should aim to be even higher than the Electoral Commission of Ghana's standards. And where we see that there are problems with the process, it's important for us to point it out. So we perfect the process, not just for ourselves, but for those coming after us, the MPs and so on, going forward into the future. If you have a level playing field, if things are fair, free and fair, you have a greater chance of unity within the party than if indeed it is skewed uh, towards particular candidates or it is simply not done very well out of incompetence or, or, or out of uh, oversight. So, uh, so I think it's important that we achieve a credible process that's free and fair and that establishes a level playing field. We need an electoral register that all of us can agree represents the true membership of the electoral college that is going to vote. We don't want a half-baked, incomplete electoral register. 
Because if you have a half-baked incomplete electoral register, then the chances for impersonation, the chances for rigging, the chances for over uh, printing ballot papers and using the excess ballot papers for mischief are great. If NDC does not show a credible process, Ghanaians will be looking at it and say, well, are these guys really ready for power? Are these guys really people honest enough that we can entrust our future and the future of our children to? These are questions that are not just internal to NDC. Because NDC is in the public eye, it's a public institution, and people are looking at it and saying that uh, we hope they do the right thing, and we believe that we're helping to achieve NDC to do the right thing. But the party says, hey, I'm running my election. I have a timetable. I have process yeah, to follow, and I'm following it. The party has a responsibility to its members. You can't have an electoral role that you disenfranchise people because names in particular constituencies are not there. Branches, constituency executives, and so on, are not, they're simply not there. You can't have a situation where your constitution says that nine executive members of each branch will vote. And then you have branches that have 28 executive members and branches that have seven executive members. Some have three. Some are not there at all. That You're not being fair to your, 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 your party members who want to vote, who want to be part of the process. You're disenfranchising them. Or you're creating situations where you, dif you disenfranchise them by the, through the back door by trying to steal an election. And we, will, we don't want to do that. We want to be credible to the Ghanaian people. And most important, we want the process to be credible to NDC people so they have belief and what they're doing, and they'll stay united as one family and not be broken up because the process was, uh, was, was, was somewhat illegitimate because the processes were not credible and transparent and did not create a level playing field. Let me give you an example. Tell me. One of the many problems NDC has had to battle over the years, from 96 in particular, is the fact that after many constituency conferences, because some candidates feel that the process has not been fair, there has not been a level playing field. Some break away and form, become independent candidates. Mm. And you look at those independent candidates and you look at the results at election time and you find that had the party stayed together and there had been no independent candidate, we probably would have won particular seats. We don't want that to multiply. The kind of register we're having, if we're not careful, that will multiply and then affect our chances in respect of our parliamentary seats come 2020. We must be careful, do the right things, and secure the future. You've been making the rounds, and yes. be honest with me here. How good are your chances? I've always been honest as a person. That's why I get into so much trouble, because <laughs> I like to speak the truth. How good are your chances? Very good, actually. As a matter of fact, scientifically, and also by way of uh, uh, hearsay evidence, and also by what we've seen ourselves, mm. it's very good. I mean, I went to a particular region, and the enthusiasm was so great. I, I was asking my guys, is this real? You know, then after two or three uh, campaign stops, I realized that it was genuinely, genuine, real, and we had real momentum. And as somebody told me this morning, the Guzi team is spreading like wildfire. Somebody called me from Tamale this morning, just mm. before I got here. He said, the Guzi team is spreading like wildfire. I said, well, that's good, because we want to take NDC to a height, a different level altogether from where it is now. If you look at where the NDC is now, yes. and what the NPP is doing, yes. if Guzi gets the nod. How big of a task do you have ahead of you? I mean, you, any opposition party has a big task to the extent that you have incumbency advantage. Fortunately for NDC, the MPP has not performed as well as some of us thought, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll offer myself as one, as one of them, honestly. I thought perhaps they'll be a little more organized, a little more clear about their policies mm -hmm. and the rollout of those policies. But clearly, they came very unprepared. They have shown truly a violent uh, nature that we thought was a matter of their past, because they have a very violent history, through the Iowa's West Wagon display. Mm. And Ghanaians, one way to alienate Ghanaians is to be violent. And I think that in this particular instance, they shot themselves very deeply in the foot. It's important for NDC to show itself as a peace party, a party that has a clear vision and clear policies. That is why after 23rd, one of the things that we're going to do is to convene our, all our policy groups, begin the healing process, begin to merge different points of view on how we attack and move this economy forward, begin to look at our social safety net program, how we're going to intervene at what levels. I don't want NDC, and Team Guzi doesn't want NDC, to become a Kim Promise affair. Why is Where the MPP a Kim Promise affair? Well, it seems, one of the nicknames, and I, 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 I always say, we must be very respectful to our president.
because he's our president, uh, Nana Kufado. But his popular name in town is King Promise. And, and it's become that because many of the things he's promised to do have not materialized. People say two and a half years is too short. Well, it is too short if indeed uh, uh, people can see that really you're implementing the building blocks for your policies. But that's not happening. There's a lot of sloganeering. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of rampant corruption mm. alleged that seem to be uh, getting out of control completely with the latest embassy issue, the drones issue, and BOST and so on. And, and these are matters that are very disturbing to Ghanaians who are becoming increasingly indebted at the household, household level because incomes are not enough. People are uh, operating a free education system, which is a laudable system. But as teachers will tell you, one, the practitioners on the ground, the headmasters, the bearers are not being allowed to speak and say that this is what is wrong with the system. Let us huddle together and fix it. Everybody is being suppressed because NPP believes that, well, this is their flagpole policy. Mm -hmm. If any criticism occurs, even though re realistically and practically the thing is not doing as well as it says, then really we're in trouble. So everybody should shut up and everybody is, 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 is basically suppressed. You talk to headmasters and they say, look, the thing is not going as well as we think. You talk to people in UNICEF, no, this is not what, what we expected. And it's become a major charge and drain on the, foreign, for, on, on the, on the country's resources. I believe it can be implemented better. When you do these kinds of programs, your first port of call is the financing of it. Mm -hmm. What kind of financing? You have short fi financing, short term, you have long term, you have soft loans, you have mixed credits. You have so many uh, types of financing that you can adapt and adjust to do this program. I believe that because it's such a fundamental transformative program, it's important to raise long term money, both domestically and also externally, soft money to support this kind of program, okay, all right? 40 year type of, so it allows you to roll, roll out systematically and in a way that is not rushed. That allows you to phase it so that at some point you know that when it all gels together, it's an efficient program. Okay. You have a problem of quality. Part of the problem of many SHS graduates today is that many of them are unemployed because one, there are no jobs, but where there are jobs, people and employers say that they are functionally illiterate. They are not numerate language barrier and many problems. And I know you know some of the international uh, observations of, our, of the quality of our education now. You need to fix that. You can only fix that by giving quality education to the teachers. You have a situation where now the teachers that will have been used, utilized to, 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 to fill the gap in terms of the shortage of teachers for the new 432,000 people who are coming into SHS1. Mm -hmm. Those teachers themselves have become students of pre-existing teachers because they don't know how to teach. They have not been exposed enough to the processes of uh, who a classroom teacher should become in terms of the psychology of the learning process, the me mechanisms and methods of teaching. So they themselves have become students. So you have pre-existing teachers handling classroom students and teachers who are students of theirs. All right? Mm -hmm. And then you have problems in relation to uh, infrastructure, which has led to the double track system, what somebody calls a traffic light school system, red, gold, green, and so on, in fun, you know. And then you have also the whole PTA arrangement that is collapsing. Because what the schools rely on, and I'm not saying that we should surreptitiously raise school fees through PTA contributions. Mm -hmm. But PTAs have been instrumental in helping schools to meet things like diesel costs of, of, of uh, vehicles. Meet things like excursion for students so that they can go around and be out of the classroom and learn qualitatively new things out of the classroom. All of these things are being curtailed. There are a lot of problems with what's going on. And NDC must be ready and able to fix these things. Yes, which, which brings me to my next question. Yeah. You've done a good job analyzing the problems yeah. and what can be done to improve them, but governance also comes with unique interventions. Absolutely. And unique ideas. Yes. Give us three uniquely goosey ideas. Diversification of our export base. How are you going to do that? Beginning with uh, uh, primary products and then building the surpluses to be able to then process into uh, higher value goods and finished products, mm -hmm. all right? Ghana has an array of agricultural products. And the good thing about Ghana is that it will never produce enough to affect the world market price, such as say, Vietnam producing so much coffee that the world price of coffee just dropped because it will, they targeted the coffee market, especially green Robusta coffee, all right? We can do a little coffee. And the income and end the surpluses for our farmers. We can do a little sesame seed. We can do groundnuts. I was exporting groundnuts. We can do groundnuts for human consumption, not for bad food. 
MPP say they are doing the same thing. They're not, um, unfortunately. They because just launched uh, wh why don't you have a look an at expansion the, of cash costs. Look at the non-traditional sector growth to trajectory and see whether anything has moved. NPP are very good at slow layering. They're doing, you see, the, the sad thing about NPP, such as free education, they have the good idea. They don't have the implemented strategy. And clearly, they don't have the vision to implement it. It's a slogan to get votes. For NDC, it must be much more than a slogan. It cannot be, as I said, just promises. It has to be well thought out programs. How they roll out, how they finance, which human beings are going to be used to implement this program, which is the target group. If you say you are going to do agriculture, you start with a market. Where is the market? What is the competition in that market? What are the cost factors? What's going to be our cost profile? What is the margin that we're going to return to the farmer? So you invest in what is doing. What is the value chain? Infrastructure, tractor, warehouses, uh, what do you call it, transportation. You work that whole thing out. Can we do it all over Ghana? No, we can't. Mm -hmm. How many industries are there in Ghana? Which has the comparative advantage to do cashew? Which has a comparative advantage to do granas? Which has a comparative advantage to sesame, maize? You work all of that out. You take maybe your 25 first districts that give you the greatest potential for success, the greatest potential for, for, for surplus, which then you use to pull the adjoining and proximate districts. So you're using poles of growth to pull the rest of the country together. Mm. You must plan these things. I can't give you exact figures. I can't give you exact quantities. But I do know, from my knowledge of agriculture, of industry, and how to create business, because I've been creating businesses, I was the first person to export sorghum out of Ghana. One of the few people to export groundnuts, cassava chips, and many other products, share nuts, and so on. It can happen, it can be done, but it takes organization. And that's why we've been telling our NDC delegates that there's a lot of work ahead for NDC. It must organize itself internally, be coherent, be transparent, be democratic, be unified, because the work ahead to transform this country, to build institutions that people believe in again. There's a tape going on. A young boy, he's speaking very large, big English. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen it. And the boy is saying basically that NDC MPP is fast becoming irrelevant today, the young people's history and future. Because they're de being de delegitimized, because they're not responding to the needs of the people. All that they're doing is fighting and attacking each other without any real solutions in relation to young people and, 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 and middle people in terms of their future, their incomes, their, uh, what do you call it, work. And Gucci is going to fix this. We will fix it. And not only, um, Gucci is not the only one going to fix it. The team NDC is going to fix it. And team Ghana is going to fix it. And we're not going to fix it immediately. We're going to fix it in phases, in a trajectory. So by 2024, 2030, Ghana is rolling as the main engine of economic development in West Africa. Because our market is 350 million people. Mm. And a little bit extra in, from, from the rest of the world. That's where we're going. Definitely. And we are going to do it. Clientelism yes. in politics. Yes. Our politics <coughs> is overly transactional. Here you are traversing the country. You're, you're being very nice and kind. <laughs> it's called you. create, chop, and share. <laughs> it's, not it's not just... Transaction is a euphemism mm. for a deep-seated noco fuel that's destroying this country. Yes. And we need to get rid of it. But for people like yourself who yeah. are looking at winning votes you are also culprits and victims at the same well, time well you can choose to be a, a culprit and a victim we have chosen not to be and you are not afraid that your decision not to engage in this kind of endeavor will affect you no, no i I've, I've made proposals to delegates and and some the broad well, that is where the problem the, is the broad, let's majority, be honest. the broad majority have responded positively and minority have not Let, let's be also honest I've said that if NDC, because part of the crisis mm. of this noco fuel, clientelism, create, share, and chop that we're seeing now and we've seen in the past, is because of the excuse that financing of political parties have given irresponsible politicians to pursue their own personal agendas in the name of political parties and in the name of lining their pockets by using the party's interests and welfare as ostensibly the reason. If we are able to achieve a coherent party financing system where parties finance themselves and the state hopefully is able to add a certain top up or the state finances itself and the parties achieve a certain top up whichever way it works out then you remove one of the principal excuses for this nuclear fuel corruption mm -hmm. agenda that is occurring in this country and is destroying this country all right i've given an example let me give you the example maybe let me test it on you test it all right ndc 
has about 4 million votes. Mm -hmm. But I think we can safely say that, both in terms of membership and in terms of keen sympathizers, it has about 2 million core members. If we can achieve an average of one CD a week contribution from these 2 million core people, we will raise 2 million CDs a week. Somebody will bring 1,000 CDs. Some well-to-do person may even bring 5,000. Most people will probably bring 50 pesos or one CD. Some not at all. But on average, you get one CD for every person. That's 2 million CDs. That's 8 million CDs a month. 96 million CDs a year. Almost 400 million CDs every four years election time. That's certainly enough to be able to run a party, take care of some of the basic welfare needs of party members and executives in terms of mm -hmm. funerals and so on and so forth, outdoorings and so on and so forth, uh, uh, meeting chairs and so on, and also funding for doing house to house and also doing developmental programs. Well, the party branches are not simply there for elections. They're also there as to participate in community development by unifying with the unit committees of the district assembly system to be able to achieve community development as has been the history of NDC. And, and pre-NDC has been the history of community organizations like CDRs in the communities, all right? If you're able to achieve this, then of course, unless you're an irresponsible political system. And I'm saying that part of our party finance laws, the, the authority that's responsible for regulating party finance, which should be electoral commission, mm -hmm. should put a cap on how much you can spend on any election, as it's done in other countries. So if you exceed that, you violated the law and you, are, you face sanctions. Okay. So if we're all being sensible and we say, okay, the cap for any national election per party should be 10 million cities. I just use that. Then we all spend within the 10 million cities. All right, then. All right? Gusi, hold your thoughts for me. Yes, sir. We will go on a break and come back for the final hurdle of our conversation. I'm, I am enjoying my conversation with Gusi. I hope you are to us. He shares his ideas on why he wants to lead the country. But you didn't know Gusi knows energy, did you? When we return, I will test Gusi's energy knowledge okay. for you. Thank Keep you. watching Face to Face. news checks as they unfold 2020 news all day all the time politics sports entertainment business and more 2020 news we bring you the world in 20 minutes twisted and tangled story of betrayal, greed, vengeance, and love in the award-winning Brazil Avenue. Carminia, a woman led by greed, gets rid of her husband who is Rita's father and sends Rita away to a filthy landfill. Rita finds love in Batata, but they are soon separated by adoption into different families far away from each other. Many years later, all paths cross again as Rita, now a renowned chef, seeks to pay back her stepmother for taking away her happiness as a child. It's a story of twists, turns, suspense, and thrilling action in Brazil Avenue. Brazil Avenue airs Wednesdays to Fridays from 10 to 11 p.m. only on City TV. Welcome back to Face to Face. And we enter the final head all of our chat with the man who wants to lead the NDC. Glad you say head <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
I, you know, I, I like sports, so I like my sports. Okay, that's very good. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you this one before we segue into energy. Recent uh, controversy. Is Namwale supporting you or not? Well, l let me tell you what happened. Because okay, I, I just want to give you factually what happened. Okay. Uh, we had a town, you know, we do town hall meetings. Yes, people uh, seem to like it. Yes, they do. Because yeah, it's a chance to dialogue. It's a chance to listen to uh, me and then a chance to listen to uh, the delegates themselves and what their concerns are. Mm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an, a good thing because it brings out the issues and allows us also to think a little bit about how to resolve those issues together okay. as a party. <clears throat> Sorry. So we were at Labadi. Okay. La Lalit Kotopong, yeah. as part of our campaign stop for the town hall meeting. Uh, we were there I, I, on the stage, and then uh, his, his honorable Namwale, who's a friend, mm -hmm. uh, came and joined us on the stage. And I thought, well, this is host constituency. Uh, everybody's welcome to come. Well, when Obuasi East, even the MPP, uh, MP of Obuasi East came to join our town hall meeting. So there was nothing oh, okay. wrong with that. Okay. And um, uh, uh, then he spoke. And he spoke about the contribution that uh, I, as a person, had, had made to the party. And some of those contributions had resulted in some of the democratic initiatives and, and reforms that had occurred in the party. And felt that I uh, was good material for the president. And I think he did say, vote for Guzi in the, in the, in the excitement of the moment. Yeah. <laughs> all of this was recorded live because some of our town hall meetings, because we can't reach all the branches, Dari Kotopan has a huge you know, delegate count, you know, and many branches, more than 100. And we don't, we're not able to, to sponsor the TNT. You know, we pay TNT, you know, okay. because you can't let somebody bring Okada and then you tell them to go on their own steam. So we pay TNT. So we, we, we tend to limit our town hall meetings to 100, 150, okay? So to reach the other branches and branch executives who are part of the Electoral College and other constituency members who cannot meet and other NDC people who can influence the vote by what they tell their family and friends and so on. We do live town hall meetings. This particular town hall meeting was being covered live by Radio Gold. Oh, okay. right? So whatever he said was not only on videotape, but also on audio being listened to by people at home. So the record of that is with Radio Gold. It was live. People heard what he said. I didn't put it in his mouth. You know, I, I must say, and to be fair to him, although he said vote for Guzi, he never said he was out of the uh, Alabi camp. Alabi, Alabi camp. He never said that. Okay. And, 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 and that's the fact. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about energy. Mm -hmm. You p perhaps f laid the foundation for GMPC. I didn't. It was a team led by Chachuchika. Chachuchika. Yes, but yes. you were part instrumental. Of the team. Yeah, I was part of the team. In that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You look at GMPC now and Ghana's dealings with oil and energy. What do you make of what you started then and where it is now? Well, I think that the institutional apparatus that uh, uh, the PNC team led by Chachu put together. Mm. You know, originally, the um, petroleum regime was governed by what you call a mining lease arrangement, which is more um, attuned to hard rock mining rather than a petroleum mining. And many um, uh, transformations are occurred in the industry. All right, and new arrangements for resource sharing between the investor and the host country, the host country's the national oil company, you know, had evolved. And so we thought that let us adapt to this new changing environment and create a national oil company that will become like Start Oil, which is the Norwegian uh, national oil company, mm -hmm. which is the largest operator in Norwegian waters and one of the biggest oil companies in the world, like Petronas, the Malaysian oil company, like uh, Brass Petro or Petrobras, who is a Brazilian oil company. So that, uh, and you know, BP originally was a state company, all right? So there's nothing wrong with the state company being the custodian of a resource on behalf of the state, which is, in this case, GMPC on behalf of Ghana. So we created those arrangements, a national oil company, a petroleum income tax law, which I was part of drafting, a national petroleum law, which basically set out the principles on which you can come in, explore for the resource, transfer technology, train local people so we can have capacity, and how we'll share that resource between investor, host country, and also, that's the state, and also GMPC as a national oil company. Those arrangements, by and large, are still in existence, okay. all right? But I think that it's important to know that 
The work that was done during that time created the foundation to establish Ghana as an oil province. Because you have to establish yourself as an oil province for people to want to come and invest in your, in your, in your jurisdiction. And in this particular case, offshore Ghana, although there's vast potential also from the Voltaire Basin onshore Ghana. All right? So that is ongoing. We think that uh, at, at every moment in time, we as a country must target a certain percentage of the resource. That becomes our foundation and what every government should try and achieve. All right? Because this resource is for 20, 25 years. It's a resource that is unrenewable. Once you drill oil and you take it out, this oil that has formed over several hundred million years, where Ghana produces from, what they call the Cretaceous, uh, Upper Albion, Lower Albion, all right? It's a particular age of rocks that are about 100 million years old or slightly below, all right? When you take it out, you're going to need another 100 million years of formation of organisms and organic matters to be able to form. And so it's coming out. So you must price the fact that your resource is non-renewable in whatever you capture from the, from, from, from the investment. Mm. All right. It's very easy and tempting to say, oh, let me lower the threshold of participation in, in Ghanaian, uh, the Ghanaian acreage all right, to attract people. But once you lower the threshold, in a context where it's already become an oil province, there are discoveries here, the risk factors are lower than they were when we started. All right. Then you're creating a problem because that resource, will never, you will never get it back again. Okay. So you need to price that in. Because the investor is looking for what? 20%? 20%, 20%? 25% upside. You can achieve that even with the most stringent, what do you call it? Uh, some regimes have 15% upside for, for the investor. Okay. We mustn't bend over backwards, you know, and shoot ourselves in the foot going forward, simply because we want foreign direct investment. In, 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 in. I hear rumors of that happening in relation to some of the blocks and some of the acreages, but it's important. And I also think we have a responsibility. You see, in our business, <clears throat> Where most of the money is, is in what we call subcontracting mm -hmm. of various services to the industry. When you bring a drilling rig into Ghana today, I don't know what the pricing is, but it's, I can assure you that it is not less than $150,000 a day. And, there's, and you have a huge, like a little township, where you're supplying food, medicine, water, and so on. It is through this local content subcontracting that we can then also build capacity. Whilst the National Oil Company is building capacity in terms of the technology, in terms of, of, of the scientific research that goes into geophysical surveys, that goes into geological surveys and interpretation, and that goes into engineering. Building that capacity so one day they also can manage and operate their own field. That has been the new dispensation that the management of GMPC during uh, Professor Mill's time brought to bear. These are things that we must be faithful to. Because if Petronas can become an operator, Start oil can become an operator. Uh, and being an operator is key. You do the procurement, you do everything. So if you're a national oil operator, naturally you operate on the basis that you serve your country's interest rather than the investor's interest. In Jubilee now, Tulu is the operator. Mm -hmm. GMPC is simply uh, a, 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 an owner of the block and in, 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 is involved in the joint management committee, but it's not the one in charge. You understand me? So yeah. all kinds of things can go. In the oil okay. industry, there are all kinds of things. All kinds of things. Right. You know, escalation of costs that are not justified because people want to transfer money out, you know. So you have to have a situation where you yourself have the capacity to do these things and you can monitor your own people, right. all right? And so we need a national oil company that stands firm, is strong, and if other countries are able to achieve it and have become even technology leaders and leaders globally and are investing in other people's oil fields, why not Ghana? Definitely. And finally, you are in the final stages of your campaign. What is Guzi, Team Guzi doing? Team Guzi is preparing for victory and preparing for the aftermath of victory. Wow. To bring NDC united as one family with a clear program, ensure that the current reorganization that has started is seen to its logical conclusion, think about how the best ways are to empower our grassroots who have been neglected for many years, particularly our branches, through training, through leadership, through community mapping, and also through uh, creating... Uh, economic employment and, and sorry, economic opportunities for them. I've been telling our people that the Ghanaian government is broke. Today, the government of Ghana says it needs 78 billion CDs to run the government. It has resources and revenue of 57 billion. It has a 21 billion CDs deficit. 
within that 57 billion is 19 billion or 4 billion dollars that you must use to pay interest, not even to pay down the loan, pay interest. So if anybody comes to say, I'm going to employ all of you, they're lying to you. What we need to do as a party and as a citizen, a good public citizen of Ghana as a party, is to begin to think of ways in which we can teach people how to fish rather than give them fish and rather than promise them things that we can never do. When you go and say, I'm going to employ all nurses, you are lying. I'm going to employ, no, no, you're not. you can't do it because you don't have the money. So we have to find a way in which we begin to evolve and develop a private sector. And the private sector is not simply a big corporation or a big company. The farmer, the market woman, is also part of the private sector. How do we enhance their role? How do we enhance small businesses? How do we support indigenous businesses so that they can then create surpluses that generate jobs and then jobs are created and people are able to spend money and the cycle of money goes round and value goes round. That's the work we have to do. Right. And after 23rd, we're going to hunker down and do the serious work and not make vague promises. But things that we will say we do, we're going to do. As I tell delegates, NDC's A must be A. It cannot be B. It must be A. Because the people of Ghana have a high faith in NDC when NDC is doing well and living by its principles. The standards of NDC are much higher than MPP. Okay. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Thank you very much as well, Mr. Gusitano. And all yes, the sir, best. Sir. Thank you. Come 23rd, Mr. Augustus Oboadun. Tano, a.k.a. Gusitano, has been our guest. I hope you enjoyed the conversation so. as much as I did. Thank My you. name is Godfrey Akutobuafo. Have a good Thanks. day.